Hello and welcome to today's show. Today I will present the best way to make routing templates that I've ever seen. I learned this from Findus or as his real name is Till on our Swedish woodworking forum a few years back and this is too good to not present to big audience. The simple trick and magic here are these cuts partially through the material. I call these scoring passes and these are used to define the outline of the cutout that you want to achieve. Compared to other methods of making routing templates, this is super simple and quick and requires no extra parts. You also easily can make more complex designs with steps and angles. I will start this with a quick one or two minute walkthrough how I created this template for the arrow. And for those of you who are a bit more experienced, this will be plenty enough to understand this method. Step 1 is to lay out the cutout that you want to make, like I have done for this arrow. And when I do this layout, I let my lines go all the way from edge to edge of my template piece. Step 2 is to transfer my layout lines to the cut surfaces of the template piece. And this is of great help if you have this part upside down on the table saw in the next step. Step 3 is to make these, as I call them, scoring passes. I cut partially through my material and I stay inside my lines. And here I use a table saw and sometimes a track saw and sometimes a combination of these. Depending on the size of the part, you could also use a sliding mitre saw where you can set the depth of the cut. Step 4 is to drill in the corners. In step 5, I remove most of the waste inside my saw lines. And for a closed construction like this, a jigsaw is used for that. For open template constructions like this one here, I prefer to use the bandsaw instead for this step. In step 6, I use a bearing guided router bit on the router table and remove the remaining waste. That makes this template shape complete and it can now be used for routing an arrow if you want to do that. There are a few optional steps as well to do after this and I will show this as well. The first optional step is to add guides or reference parts to your template. This one here for instance makes sure that all your routed arrows, if you make many, ends up on the same distance from an edge. Final optional step is to add these holes from the side so you can clamp the template to your workpiece. If you make many this is a quite nice feature but for one of double sided adhesive will do. A quick reflection which side to use towards the workpiece. If you use it like I did here, you have a smooth sliding surface for a router without any interruptions, but you have small holes in the corner that won't give any tear out support to the workpiece. If you use it the other way around, you will have some grooves here where the router can get caught, but you have full tear out support for the workpiece in the corners. So it's a bit depending on the situation. Now I will slow down the pace considerably and build two templates from scratch and show every step in detail. I will start with this one here, it's a template for a quite simple rectangular hole. This one is used for a draw pull grip, but this template type could be used for many things. Then I will finish up with this template here, that's a template type I use for table bases or chair bases where I want this design with tapered legs and smooth rounded corners with tangent transitions. Then I will finish up with a short bonus, a quick walkthrough how to make this template with much bigger corner radius. I should also point out that this video is not that much about using the templates and the actual routing. This is mainly about making the templates. As template material I prefer to use MDF but pretty much anything goes. The thinnest I used was 10mm and that worked out very well. In some situations you want clamping options, you want to be able to clamp the template to your workpiece and sometimes you want the clamps to be out of the way to not collide with your router later on. And for those occasions I drill these holes from the side that fits the micro jig dovetail clamps like this so the clamps are out of the way. You could also use the Festo rail clamps in the same concept. And for these occasions where you need clamping holes from the side, I recommend that you go up to 19mm template thickness. For a draw pull grip template like this, we often get away with clamping out here around the template without any risk of interfering with the router. So in this case I will be using quite thin MDF, this is 12mm and I have prepared this with straightening one edge, this is the reference edge. I also made one square corner. We actually don't need that square corner in this case, but it's a good habit to always have one. 
To later make the actual pull grip feature, I will be using this router pull grip bit together with a guide bushing in my router. And using a guide bushing like this means that the pull grip feature will be smaller than the hole that we have in the template. But the dimensions are not important for today's video, so I leave that offset for you to calculate. Since the dimensions are not that critical for today's video, I just eyeball this one based on the old template that I have. Then I make one line here, edge to edge. I make another line here, edge to edge. Then I make two lines in the other direction as well. One here, also that edge to edge. And then one up here, just as the first one, edge to edge. This means the basic layout is complete and the hatched area is where the opening in the template will be later on. And if you want the specific dimensions for this area, that is easily achieved. I then go ahead and transfer my layout lines to the end grain side of the MDF. And for square cutouts like this, this is only needed on two sides. And which two sides you will learn quickly when you use this method for a while. Then I head over to the table saw to set the blade height for the scoring passes partially through the material. Here you only need to go high enough for the router bearing to have something to ride on later on. Don't go too high with the blade height and cut away too much of your template thickness because then you will lose the stability of the template. So I aim for about 5 or 6 millimeters. If it's a thicker template you can go higher than that. Then it's time to make the first two cuts, the long cuts, and for both these cuts we keep the reference side towards the fence on the table saw. Then I will make the cuts, so I just touch the line and cut inside my lines, so here will be the first cut position, and then the second cut will be done in this position. That was the longer cuts. The shorter cuts I will make on my crosscut sled. You could also use a miter gauge for this. If you use the crosscut sled you have to raise the blade height a bit to compensate for the sled thickness and you don't have to match the first two cuts that you made. It's just roughly set it to the same height. Just as for the long cuts, reference edge against the fence. And then also here I cut inside my lines. That was the four scoring passes. If you missed your lines slightly, you can always adjust outwards, but you can't adjust inwards. Now we had four cuts and we used this reference side for all the cuts. That means that these two lines are parallel and as long as our crosscut sled or miter gauge is at the right angle, these two lines are at the right angle towards the reference surface. This means that we now have an inner rectangle here with four square corners. Then I drill holes in the corners to be able to jigsaw in the next step. Here it's okay if you drill into your cut saw grooves, but don't drill outside them. Here are cuts, so I only have a part of the saw groove remaining, and the same as for the drilling, don't cut outside the saw grooves. The final step is to route away the remaining waste in the hole, so I install a router bit with a bearing on top and then I set the height so that the bearing rides on the saw groove surface and then I will route away the waste. This means the hole is complete. You could get a small step inside between the saw surface and the routed surface, but that really doesn't matter. If we look on the corners, these are perfectly rounded and matching the router bit diameter. So these grooves didn't cause us any step or other problem in the corner. And as long as the router bit radius is bigger than the width of the saw groove, which I would say it always is, the grooves will not cause us any corner problems. This rule about router bit radius versus the width of the saw groove it only applies to square corners, but I would say I never experienced any problems even when doing angles. But of course if you do really low angles, like this one here, at some point the router bit will start bumping into the groove and make a small step in the corner.
Now we have a few different options how to lay out the template on the workpiece for doing the routing. I will show you the most basic one and also a slightly improved variant. For one-offs the most basic variant is that you add center lines for your cutout on your template. You can do this already when you lay out the saw lines. And then you transfer these center lines to the inner hole surfaces. And then on your workpiece you make a cross for the center where you want to make the routing. Then it's just a matter of aligning these center lines. Then you clamp the template in place and make the routing. I like to spend a little more time and at least have a stable reference edge on the long side of my template. In that case I measure where to lay out this reference edge. Then I make a line using the reference side on the template. And then I screw down a straight piece of wood in that position. The next level of reference accuracy I just want to show you with an example. You see it on this template here. Here I routed a shallow groove on this side here and I used the reference side towards my router table fence. Then this straight piece of wood has a hard edge to land against when I install it. This makes sure that everything is as parallel as possible. But this level of reference accuracy is usually not needed. The template is complete with a nice stable side reference and it's time to do the routing. I will do this very quickly since the routing itself is not the focus of today's video. If you want to see more about routing these pull grip features, you can watch the laminate and linoleum part 3 video. I put the template on my workpiece and with this straight edge here, it's really easy to align it towards the front edge of the workpiece. Then I slide it sideways until I align it with my sideway center marks. And here I clamp the template in place in two positions. I then put the guide bushing on my router and the 10mm straight bit almost to full depth and this is to remove most of the waste before making the final pass with a pull grip bit. I then leave the template in place and switch to the router pull grip bit and make one final pass with this router bit. That looks like a really nice pull grip feature. It could require some light sanding, but except from that this one looks really good. If I'm satisfied with this pull grip and I consider the template to be a keeper, I mark it with some vital info, the pull grip size, the guide bush that was used, the depth of the final routing and the router bit that I used. It's time for the next template of today and it's this one here. This is a template type I often use for shaping furniture pieces after I glue them together. This could illustrate like a small table base or a chair base where I'm after this look with tapered sides and smooth flowy look with tangent transitions in the corner. I've done some preparation in advance here. I made this construction out of ash and this should illustrate like a small table base. Then I have the template material and that's in 19mm MDF since I intend to use the clamps from the side. And as usual I have my reference edge and that will be used for the layout. But here I also squared up all the corners for more complex template shape like this. It's a good habit to have square corners on all sides on the template. As you can see the template is slightly oversized compared to my workpiece and that is to not have it too flimsy later on when I cut away most of it. But you can't make it too much oversized because then you won't reach with the clamps from the side. So you have to check with the clamps before you desire the template size. Here I also have some extra distance and that is to have a starting distance later on on the router table. I start the layout by setting a baseline where the bottom of the legs should be. So I just eyeball this dimension and then I make a line using my reference edge as the reference. In the same position I make one baseline on the back side of my template as well. That could be good to have later on, then we can use any side of the template that we want. Then I just eyeball center my workpiece left to right while I place it on the line. Then I make lines here on the inside of my workpiece so I know where that is. The final routing here will be done with a 19mm router bit. So I place a 19mm circle in the inner corner and then I want to remove as little as possible. So I just place it so that I have some margin to the corner. Then I make an 
arc in this position. If I had a longer version of this, I could use my reference edge for laying out the top line, but I don't. But it really doesn't matter since my template part is square and nice. So I take this arc line and then I transfer it into a parallel line over to the other side. Then I use my reference edge and the protractor to lay out the tapered sides. The angle itself is not of any importance. This is just an example. I make it at 2 degrees. I then extend my free lines to go edge to edge. That completes the layout. Then depending on what tool you use in the next step, you might need lines on the end grain sides or you might not need them, but let's make the end grain lines just in case. To make the scoring passes for the angle lines, you have at least three different options. Number one is to set your miter gauge to the same angle as your desired taper angle and use your end grain layout lines to make the cuts. Number two is pretty much identical but using the crosscut sled instead. So here I clamp my workpiece at an angle and then I aim for my layout lines. None of these options is the one that I use. I don't like to work blind with angle lines. So now I show you option three and this is the one I use for more complex template shapes. Option three is to use a track saw for cutting the angle lines. And this is what I use very frequently when making these kind of templates. The big advantage here is that you're working from the right side. You see your layout lines and it's easy to aim for the line with the edge of the guide rail. You might notice there that I didn't go all the way out to the edge and that's another advantage with using the track saw. I can stop my cuts and leave the template as stable as possible. This stopped cut technique was also used to create this butterfly shape that I showed in the beginning of this video. As long as your template is not too big in this direction, a sliding mitel saw where you can lock the blade height is also a very good option for making these kind of stopped cuts. For the cleanup routing this time I will be using a 19mm router bit, the same diameter that later will be used for routing my workpiece. It's not totally necessary to have the same diameter, but it simplifies the layout a bit later on. That makes the template almost complete. The only thing remaining is the clamping holes from the sides. Here it's important to not drill all the way through to the inside of the template. So I put a piece of tape on my drill bit to make sure that I stop at the correct depth. I'm using a 12mm drill bit which suits the dovetail clamps very well. <laughs> template completed. Now it's a matter of shaping our workpiece after the template. Then I place the workpiece on the back side of my template. That's a slight advantage in this case and I'll show you in next step why. I place it down here on my base lines and if I was to make many of these I might add hard stops here as a reference but for a one-off like this, this is good enough. Then I make sure to have about the same protrusion left and right side and that it's symmetric. Then I clamp the workpiece to the template. Then I flip the package over and transfer the contour from the template to my workpiece. And here in the corner you can see a slight advantage by using the back side of the template. This means that I have an unbroken radius that I easily can transfer to my workpiece. After removing most of the waste on the bandsaw, I reattach my workpiece to the template. And if we flip the package and check on the other side, we should have a minimum amount of workpiece protruding from the template and that is to simplify the routing as much as possible. So let's head over to the router table and use this template and see the results. Here I will be using this bottom bearing of this router bit and that bearing will roll on the template and follow the template shape. This distance I have here in front of the workpiece is very good because when I start this means that the bearing has something to roll on before my router bit comes in contact with the workpiece. If we go ahead and check the result it looks okay to me. 
There is no tear out anywhere on the lines are crisp and sharp. This video was not about the routing itself, but here I have to say a few words. I used a spiral cutter for this operation and this cutter is quite decent at routing against the grain. But if you experience tear out when you route this shape, you might consider skipping the clamp option and instead attach the workpiece to the template using double side adhesive. With the workpiece attached to the template using double side adhesive and the router cutter with a bearing both at the bottom and at the top, you have the possibility to choose routing direction and avoid going against the grain. When I have the cutter at this height, the bottom bearing is active and I route in this direction. If I then flip the package and lower the cutter, now the top bearing is active and routing in this direction is the opposite grain direction compared to before. The purpose of this final template is the same as the previous one. To create some flowy lines in your furnitures with tangent radius transitions between the parts. But here the corner radius is much bigger than before and much bigger than your router bit radius. And that puts some special requirements when you make the template. I will give this as a one minute quick walkthrough. I start by drilling a 50 millimeter hole in my template. And then after that I make my layout lines. And then at the table saw I start slightly at the safe side. Make a first pass and check if I'm at tangent with a hole. And if I'm not, I shim the workpiece with tape until I reach perfect tangent. And then for the crosscut, I do the same operation on the crosscut sled. I shim with tape pieces until I reach perfect tangent. On the router table this time I stop before I reach my radius and I start the next cut after the radius. So I leave the radius untouched. This leaves a small rest in the corner and this is later removed using a chisel and a sandpaper. When you later use this template, whether it's handheld or on the router table, here is a small difference compared to the earlier templates I did. There the inner radius was always equal to the router bit radius and it didn't matter how high you set the bit. Here you have to set the bit so that the bearing rolls on this continuous rounded surface. A small tip and then we close this show. If you want this corner radius to be bigger than your largest drill bit, then you can make the first circle of cutout with a router and the circle league. That's it for today and I hope that at least some of you learned something new. Thanks for watching.